Good morning, everyone, both here uh, in the room and online. Welcome to this uh, first uh, inaugural lecture of the LIMS, uh, the Interdepartmental Laboratory Memory and Society, which was established at the University of Trento in 2022, and which is co-managed by the Department of Humanities, this department, and the Department of Sociology and Social Research. It is a pleasure, uh, an honor, and personally also a kind of emotion to welcome our guest speaker, Professor Aleida Asman. Without any hesitation, I would define her as one of the most open and free minds in uh, world thought today. Actually, she does not need any presentation. By the way, she's a professor of English literature and literary theory at the University of Constance. And she is a leading scholar in the field of cultural memory studies. She has been visiting professor at the universities of Princeton, Yale, and Wien. She was awarded several prizes, such as uh, together with her husband, Jan Asman, the Balzan Prize for Studies on Collective Memory in 2017, and the Peace Prize of German Book Trade in 2018. She is author of hundreds of publications. Among her main books, I would like to mention a couple, both in their um, English translations, namely Cultural Memory and Western Civilization, Arts of Memory, Cambridge 2011, and Shadows of Trauma, Memory and the Politics of Western Identity, New York 2015. Aleda Asman is an all-around scholar whose work has impacted highly on several disciplines, such as literature, history, sociology. She is a specialist of the structures, mechanisms, and media of cultural memory, of the relationship between memory, oblivion, and trauma, and of the relationship between memory and history. As an historian myself, I would like to underline that it was also thanks to her deep and sophisticated reflection that starting from the 90s, memory was reintegrated into the agenda of the historian, from where it had been expunged in light of an older positivistic uh, prejudice as the realm of subjectivity, of distortion, of falsification. Today, cultural memory is not anymore conceived as something external, something antinomic to history, but is instead a constitutive ingredient of history as a scientific discipline, as an important, a fundamental aspect of doing historical research. And in this framework, I would also like to underline that the Trento team of ancient historians holds a special scholarly relationship and owes a special scientific debt to Aleida and Jan Asman's reflection on cultural memory, which, thanks to the pioneering work of Maurizio Giangiulio, led to the establishment of a new way of doing ancient history. For that reason, we are extremely grateful to Aleida Asman for her scholarly mastery first and for in accepting our invitation today. Today, she will offer some important reflections on the transformations, historical transformations of the European dream, uh, some uh, reflections which were in part already developed in one of her most uh, recent books, uh, which I can show you here in its uh, uh, Italian translations, Il Sogno Europeo, Quattro Lezioni dalla Storia, as a perfect way to show the dynamic relation between the past and the present, between cultural memory and historical developments, and also as a perfect way to emphasize the importance of a memory education she will comment on some of the main trajectories, historical, political, legal, moral, intellectual trajectories, which have led to the establishment of Europe as a political entity and also as an imagined community. So welcome once again to Aleida Asman. Thank you once again. Uh, with a, a great pleasure, I'm going to give you the floor. Thank you so much, um, Georgia, for this wonderful introduction. Um, and also thank you for the invitation into your um, thinking room, a thinking space that you have developed. And I really find myself very well <clears throat> um, accommodated in this um, lab that you have um, put up memory and uh, society. Because as you just said, um, I come from literature 
but I have always considered literature to be part of history and part of society and or sociology and um, but usually in the disciplines at the university uh, we have very little interaction going on so the interdepartmental lab uh, is very important and I think you are um, really a pioneer because in many places this does not yet work so well as as um, <clears throat> you have uh, described it now um, behind this uh, row of books. Uh, Jan Asman is also in the same room and he is also pleased to have been uh, included in your warm welcome. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very happy um, here to <clears throat> uh, contribute to your <clears throat> uh, collaborative research and I will do it by telling you a little bit about the historical transformations of the European dream. <clears throat> and I thought the best way of starting uh, would be to introduce you, give you a brief uh, introduction um, to myself. Um, because when speaking of historical transformations, it really makes sense to start with those transformations that I have witnessed myself within my own lifetime. One grows older and before you know it, you have turned into a witness of history. So let me start my lecture by sharing with you the different Europes that I have witnessed while growing up in West Germany after the Second World War. My thinking about Europe took a new turn <clears throat> after 2015 when I felt a growing sense of responsibility for what I have called my in my book, The European Dream. And now when looking back, I became aware of the fact that these Europes differ considerably from each other. And I assume that younger Europeans <clears throat> tend to have a much more unified historical concept of the EU <clears throat> as a project, because it is projected into the past. But it was not uh, <clears throat> very homogeneous at all. So to warn you against this homogenization, I want to you my gift in three or, and right now I must add in four Europe's that differ considerably from each other. So here you see three Europe's. The first um, Europe I grew up in was created after the Second World War. <clears throat> it lasted from 45 when you know the end of the Second World War, which uh, was the possibility of the new beginning into 1989. In this Europe, there was much talk in Germany of the Christian, Christian Occident, das christliche Abendland. And this conservative rhetoric <clears throat> had no appeal to me at all. Uh, and much later, I, it occurred to me that this formula in West Germany had a clear function, the function to cover up the Nazi crimes of the past, to conjure up a grand historical and imperial continuity across the abyss of the war, the capitulation and the so-called hour zero. Nor did I <clears throat> know anything then about the architects of this Europe, um, whom we recognize today as our heroes. Like many others of my 68th generation, I thought Robert Schumann was a composer, and I had never heard the name René Cassin, who prepared the Declaration of Human Rights in 48 and was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1968. So in the year of the 68th generation, but I'm sure nobody of the 68th generation had heard of Cassin. The music played for me elsewhere. <clears throat> uh, everything important. For me, at that in the first decade, four decades of my lifetime uh, came from the United States or from England, the civil rights and youth protest movements, films, pop music, the Beatles. Europe <clears throat> at that time was still part of a transatlantic West and I owe my intellectual and cultural initiation to the United States. The East, on the other hand, was locked up during the Cold War. This first Europe of polarization was stabilized by the opposing ideologies of capitalism and communism. But there were also parallels between the two. And this was 
the time regime of modernity. Both express, expected everything, both regimes, everything from the future and <clears throat> were optimistic about rapid so, social and uh, economic and technological progress. Progress was the number one uh, formula. Both capitalism and communism invested <clears throat> in space exploration, which led to the moon landing in 69. The past, however, was totally forgotten. It was literally on the other side of the moon. <clears throat> now, the second phase followed from 89 to 2015. I call it the Europe of pluralization. With the fall of the Berlin Wall and the erosion of state socialism, the integrating power of polarization and <clears throat> was exhausted. The EU became more and more interesting for me as <clears throat> the East of Europe moved closer. Today, people in the West talk, um, are sort of um, embarrassed about the colonial extension towards the East. For me at the time, the end of the Cold War and what followed was an unprecedented enlarging of my geographical and cultural horizon. A new space and many worlds opened up between the pole of the East and the West. I was suddenly able to cross dangerous borders, meet people, building civil society in many Eastern cities and had the chance to learn so much more. After four decades of dropping and forgetting the past, the history of the first half of the 20th century also returned to Europe because the horizon broadened not only in space, but now also in time. So it was not only a border in space that collapsed, it was a border in time that collapsed. Eastern European archives opened in 1992, which meant that a new phase of historical research began. Also Holocaust research really started after this uh, opening. And not only that, memory returned. The survivors of the Holocaust finally found a hearing. And uh, <clears throat> so um, in January 2000, a new transnational politics of history emerged, um, starting in Sweden and supported by the USA and Israel, in which the United Germany played also an important part. <clears throat> this was followed, um, I'm speaking of the Stockholm Declaration, on the 27th of January in 2000, uh, the IRA uh, was formed, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. And this was followed by new monuments, museums, and the reconstruction of memorial sites. Between the West and the East, Europe emerged anew in 89 as a plural entity with different political perspectives, historical experiences, and also traumas. It became polyphonic to the extent that it freed itself from the grip of the West and the East. Thus, a Europe emerged that asserted itself between the global powers and set new accents. It continued its Western course of peacekeeping, democratization, and economic prosperity, but supplemented it with as well as a risk of the environment. Now, the third Europe began in 2015. It was triggered global migration crisis, which has, of course, much longer causes, but only with the influx of refugees did it abruptly enter the general consciousness as a memorable impact event. In this new phase, marked by division now, Bind, the binding and integrating power of the EU was on its decline. The plural Europe is now <clears throat> put to the test everywhere by nationalists mobilizing against the EU in ever more aggressive and xenophobic tones. Ideological rifts are opening up and divisions are becoming manifest. This um, is why I call it a, a split um, phase of the EU. Um, the split occurring within the nation states and not between them. 
more. Ideological rifts are opening and divisions are becoming manifest no longer between the whole uh, systems, but within the societies. Now, <clears throat> since Putin's, um, this is the third, uh, which is now muting into uh, the fourth Europe in which I have lived since February 24, 22. Um, Putin's aggressive war against the Ukraine. <clears throat> I live now in my fourth Europe. This time, the orientation of the EU has changed from keeping peace to sustaining a peaceful country that was invaded against all principles of international law. In retrospect, I can now say that the enemy of the EU has changed many times, four times indeed. During the first <clears throat> polarized Europe, my Europe number one uh, of the Cold War, um, the East or the West were the respective uh, enemy. Now, then during the second uh, phase, the pluralized Europe, it was Hitler or Stalin, respectively. Um, then during the third antagonistically divided Europe, it was the figure of the migrant who was framed as a stranger, as a threatening stranger who disturbs and disrupts the homogeneity of the society and threatens the unity of the nation. And now during the fourth Europe that finds itself in support of a mutilated nation state fighting for its right to exist according to its own self-definition, now the EU's enemy is now Putin as imperial aggressor and violator of peace. So far, my short overview over my own historical assessment and experience of um, the developments or historical transformations of the EU. And in my lecture now, I will start my series of a description of European dreams, and we can also call them European moments or European charismatic moments. <clears throat> With the, I will start it not as you will expect with the end of the Second World War, but um, I will start with the end of what the French and the British still call the Great War. I'm convinced that if we start this series of imagining and reimagining Europe only in the 50s, we lose an essential part of the story and forget seminal voices to whom we are deeply indebted and whom we ought to remember as models of modern Europeans of the first generation. And um, <clears throat> therefore, I start uh, here with uh, after the years after 1918. The huge problem after the Great War was that it ended <clears throat> with a truce and contracts, but continued to rage in the minds and hearts of many people, especially the Germans. For many, it was, um, the war was in fact never ended, but went right on and found its continuation in the Second World War. In the 1920s, the society was polarized through a political climate of resentment and polarization. Carl Schmitt, um, influential formula um, that demands to clearly separate friend from foe and to clearly identify your enemy in order to know who your own identity is a very clear example of this continuing belligerent political emotional atmosphere of the 1920s, so 100 years uh, um, back from today. While intellectuals like Ernst Jünger, Martin Heidegger, or Karl Schmitt, and politicians like Hitler passed on the poison of this hatred and of nationalism and used it as a drug to mobilize the minds and the masses, Jewish um, philosophers and writers went in the opposite direction and tried to lay the foundations for the new democracy. <clears throat> While Martin Buber, and Karl Löwit, for instance, created in the 1920s a new dialogic philosophy based on a new anthropology 
that links the individual to their fellow human beings. So it's no longer the subject um, in its splendid autonomy, who is totally, you know, uh, uh, in a solipsistic situation, only confronted with an object, which runs through German uh, philosophy um, as a dominant theme. But they try to <clears throat> Uh, deconstruct this this model and to restore the sense of the human being as linked to other um, individuals whom they called Mitwelt und Umwelt, fellow beings and local environment. Um, these are the philosophers. I cannot go into this, um, but I want also to mention here <clears throat> Moritz Julius Bonn. <clears throat> who drew the lessons from the devastating war to create the, the first version of the European dream. Um, Bonn, for instance, <clears throat> he was a political scientist and uh, theoretician of democracy. He coined um, actually the formula of the resilient and resisting democracy, Wehrhafte Demokratie. And he declared in 19... Um, 31, that the political model of the empire was totally <clears throat> exhausted and finished, and he predicted that it would be replaced by a federation. federation. Then uh, Stefan Zweig, whom I want to mention here, was inspired by a very concrete vision of the European dream when he laid out his plans for a detoxification of the German minds and a cure for the disease of the hatred inspired by aggressive nationalism. He said, we must no longer think of putting together what is now in ruins. Instead, we need to build up something new and seek a more fruitful form that is still unformed. And this is exactly the Europe. Uh, he has a Europe in mind that has then become uh, reality long um, after his um, suicide in exile. Zweig's hope for a new future was focused on a new culture of peace addressed to the young generation. And in his and this ut utopian spirit, he wrote an educational program for the youth of a new Europe. In search for a remedy that would overcome hatred and nationalism, he started from a very simple basic idea. In, it consists in emphasizing the commonality between the peoples of um, Europe more than their antagonism. He remarks that the child has been taught to love his native land, a conception with which he is in accord, but he adds the wish <clears throat> that he were taught at the same time to love the common uh, home of Europe and the world and the whole world, the whole of ma mankind to present the concept of fatherland, not in a hostile way, but in a bond with other fatherlands. Zweig's European dream was not directed towards the abolishing of nations, but the taming of militant nationalism. This meant for him deconstructing heroic myths that glorify war and legitimate violence. And this is really the core of what Europe is all about until today, I think. I repeat the sentence, deconstructing heroic myths that glorify war and legitimate violence. He recalls his own history lessons and he writes, we were deliberately kept in the dark about the cultural achievements of other neighboring nations and knew only <clears throat> Uh, and we only learned about battles under which uh, generals we had met them in war. Zweig recommends a radical change in the school curriculum, replacing war history with cultural history. <clears throat> the latter could be based on discoveries and inventions, art, science, and technology, thus establishing esteem and honoring common achievements. Zweig designs an educational program for a vigilant and responsible generation. He calls it kind of elite, which knows foreign languages, <clears throat> um, even intellectual army, um, 
for uh, who, foreign languages, foreign customs, and the foreign countries from its own experience. With such a rise of such an intellectual art in the various nations, he hoped to overcome the dull mistrust of nations, and that together we shall conquer the future. In his European dream, after the Great War, it focuses on a new culture and curriculum for the youth of Europe that changes its place from the nation against um, Europe. I think uh, this is important from the nation against Europe to the nation in Europe. I think, again, this is the core idea about uh, what uh, Europe, uh, the EU is today all about. This has lost none of its relevance. Nation in Europe meant for him the idea of, high, of a higher concord between nations while preserving the individuality of all the nations. With this concise, uh, concise formula, he already captured, I think, the core the, uh, European dream and designed an educational program that switches from hatred to gratitude and reverence, from war to peace, from ad admiration of military force to recognition of intellectual and cultural achievements. Instead of instilling fear in each other, nations should distinguish themselves by what earns them love and reverence throughout the world and raises the prestige of their language and intellectual achievements. And then he also adds, after the Great War, that he wrote from a position of a generation uh, this is very important, that has known the most terrible hatred in the world and has learned to hate the hatred because it barren and diminishes the creative power of humanity. So Zweig's history um, European dream is based on a practical project, namely the moral detoxification of Europe. Of Europe. And I move now to the second uh, chapter, and that is the European dream after 1945, um, a new legal um, space economy. There are two groups of protagonists involved in creating a new Europe, um, a new European dream after the Second World War. The first group consists in three politically engaged Jewish scholars, Jewish scholars and diplomats, who created new laws and thereby erected a new transnational little space. As Zweig, as Zweig had responded in his European dream to the hatred and violence of the First World War, these lawyers responded in to the huge crimes committed by the Nazi regime in the Second World War. And, um, and under cover of this war. When Churchill witnessed the invasion of German troops into Russia, Russian territory in August uh, 1941, he spoke of a crime without a name, a crime without a name. After 45, it became fully apparent that crimes of a new magnitude had been committed for which there were no names. The first thing, therefore, to end the Second World War were the Nuremberg trials in which these new crimes could be named and addressed. It took decades of the, uh, for the invention of the new terms to develop and to be implemented in the international legal system. This is a story of the 1940s and involved three important and founders of the new Europe. And here uh, they are. Number one is Hersch Lauterpacht, who added the term crime against humanity to ensure individual rights vis-a-vis -vis the auto atrocities committed by Nazi officials at the Nuremberg trials. Um, another one is Raphael Lemkin, uh, who added the term genocide in 1948 to ensure the rights of collective cultural groups, especially in their role of Marxists, against their persecution and annihilation. And the third one uh, already mentioned, René Cassin, 
who reacted and redefined for Europe after 45 the term human rights, also in 1948. And these three lawyers, uh, I should um, uh, add, um, uh, Cassin already fought in the in the Great War, in the First World War, and all of them lost uh, a huge size of their families um, in the in the Holocaust. So they have their own history written into these legal systems. And <clears throat> these laws and concepts were further developed, picked up in the EU and incorporated into the legal system of the EU in 1988, 1998. The Rome Statute, <clears throat> for the International Criminal Court now criminalizes for aggressions, transgressions, the crime of genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression. The last one is Putin's uh, crime right now with the war that we are experiencing. The short message uh, of this long continuous struggle for these new laws, uh, they were all, um, um, conceived and developed by Europeans for Europe and perhaps uh, also for the rest of the world, International Criminal Court. The short message uh, is never again, never again. These laws are a dramatic chapter in European history that needs to be told because it shows how individual people who fought in the war and experienced the horrors of the Shoah in their own families spent their lives fighting for and creating a better future. Their European dream <clears throat> that they crafted and drafted deserves our admiration and gratitude. Now, the second part <clears throat> in the 1950s, it was the brilliant idea of Jean Monnet and Robert Robert Schumann to build a European edifice, not from top down, but by integrating key sectors of the economy in order to create genuine solidarity <clears throat> between the partners. For this reason, Monet had developed a post-war modernization plan for both France and Germany, based on the idea of establishing a common market for the industry of coal and steel. When Schumann introduced this concept into the political reality, <clears throat> Um, he added his particular commitment, which was a, a commitment towards um, reconciliation, uh, a very strongly religiously supported commitment for reconciliation. They both ended an age-old hereditary Franco-German enmity by using the raw materials of the war industry and literally turned <clears throat> those materials into plowshares. The economic vision of a team was because it created a new beginning on peace, parity, a new beginning and shared forgetting of past. Something that is very seldom uh, mentioned that this new beginning was actually based on that forgetting. And to show you the spirit of the time, I will give you um, part of a speech from Churchill, which um, he held in uh, Zurich University, um, uh, addressed to the students, to the youth, when he said, we must all turn our backs upon the horrors of the past. We must look to the future. We cannot afford to drag forward across the years that are to come the hatreds and revenges which have sprung from the injuries of the past. If Europe is to be saved from infinite misery and indeed from final doom, there must be an act of faith in the European family and an act of oblivion, oblivion against all the crimes and follies of the past. So I will not comment this statement and move on now to uh, my next. Um, uh, chapter of the dream, and this is Euro European dream after 1989. After uh, 89, the spark of Europe of the European dream did not only go east, 
it also affected and changed the Western European nations. This shows that in the light of further European dreams, the EU was no longer just an economic community, but also a community of laws and values. And I think this transition from um, Wirtschaftsgemeinschaft based on economy to a Wertegemeinschaft based on values has a lot to do with this next step of the um, European dream. Member states that step by step abandon their democratic structures and principles are under close scrutiny and are also sanctioned. In other words, the EU acts like an um, insurance system against the danger that civil nation states deteriorate and mutate into militant nation states. By 1989, the important protagonists of the European dream have moved eastward. On the level of politicians, they are, of course, Mikh Mikhail Gorbachev, who renounced military counterforce, except for Lithuania, where the process of self-liberation was a bloody one, and George Bush Sr., who claimed proudly, we have won the Cold War. It was not the American president, however, who won the war, but, <clears throat> for instance, individual and brave members of civil society in many cities of the GDR engaging in a revolutionary act to bring down the wall. There were also not to forget the less visible so-called Helsinki groups, very important Helsinki groups, that had formed in Soviet countries since the 1970s, like Havel's Carta 77, Valesa Solidarność, and others. The Romanian and Hungarian philosopher and intellectual Gaspar Miklos Tamas speaks of these less visible proponents of the European dream when he wrote, many political scientists talk about the system change coming from outside and from above. Nonsense. The change of system was not made by the whole people, but we were two, three million people at the time. At that time, there were clubs, debates, meetings, demonstrations. It was unbelievably fermenting in the society. This irrepressible will for freedom in 1989, this pathos for freedom, that was a moment of great beauty that remi remains. And I just found out that um, he died in January this year. The important lingering question today is <clears throat> whether the European dream of these civil society initiatives was hijacked by other forces such as the West German state and Western economy, but also by growing symptoms of a new nationalism that is pulling in the other direction. In this situation, we see clearly the difference pointed out by Stefan Zweig between the nation in Europe or the tamed and civil nation and the nation against Europe, presenting anew the image of the self-centered and militant nation. By mobilizing against Europe, the European dream has become the target of right-wing parties. We can witness how neo-nationalists have found in the EU a common enemy against whom they are rallying and forming new transnational alliances. Let me illustrate this development with an example. In August 2017, a group of Visegrad uh, countries headed to Brussels to see, to visit the new house of uh, European history. <clears throat> and um, the delegation uh, visited it and looked at it, but was not impressed with what they saw. At the House of um, History in Brussels, European history is presented across borders as a network of relationships. And this is how the museum itself describes its uh, exhibits. It says, as we take you, <clears throat> as we take you through the main exhibition, you notice that we don't tell you the story of each European nation. 
Instead, we want to explore how history has shaped a sense of European memory and continues to influence our lives today and in the future. As in our own lives, some things we want to remember, some things we like to forget. And of course, the same event can be interpreted from different perspectives. Now, I think this is a very inter interesting commentary for um, House of History, European history. And I think it is very closely related to your interdepartmental um, lab uh, memory and society. But the visitors from the Visegrad countries, <clears throat> um, they found the parallels and cross connections, but what they considered the most important and sacred thing of all, namely their respective nation did not appear at all in this museum. Feeling unrepresented by Brussels, they criticized the museum as a malicious fake and a destruction of history. Polish Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki had another explanation ready. Due to the complete absence of a national perspective, he, dis he discovered a communist influence <clears throat> on the museum. He saw in the EU a new edition of the Soviet Union and the Poles once again in the role of victims facing an ideological enemy. He judged the exhibition as a homage to the homo sovieticus, a man without nationalities <clears throat> in a homogeneous mass of identical nations. What he experienced was a repetition in history. In his view, Brussels was the new Moscow. <clears throat> when we think about the nation, Historical experiences and feelings are unquestionably involved. <clears throat> in Poland, for many people, the lesson of their historical experience was strengthen the nation. After enemy invasions and periods of occupation, the country had disappeared from the map several times. No sooner had the Polish state been rebuilt after World War I, then it experienced long periods of persecution and violent occupation by Hitler and Stalin during World War II. Therefore, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the EU became the guarantor for post-Soviet states to regain and confirm their nation states. Poland celebrates the victory over Nazi Germany uh, on May 8th, together with the Western European nations and no longer on May 9th. The post-Soviet nations strengthened their suppressed culture and history by promptly opening national museums after 1990, in which they presented their previously suppressed history of suffering, suffering under Stalin, but not necessarily the history of collaboration with Hitler. I move now <clears throat> to my next chapter, and this is uh, comparing the American with the European dream. When I published my book about, about uh, the European dream in 2018, I had overlooked that this Title already used by Jeremy Rifkin. Um, in 2004, this American economist had published his version of the European dream. It was an homage to the European dream, which Rifkin preferred to the American dream. While democracies, a democracy and the nation state have stagnated in the US, in Rifkin's view, both have made considerable progress in Europe. For the first time in history, Rifkin notes, nations have come together to give up voluntarily part of their sovereignty in order to secure their economies and their common legal system. Rifkin eloquently explains why the European dream is superior to the American dream. The American dream is fading while the European dream is steadily gaining contours. It is already morally superior. 
<clears throat> we the Americans are fixated on property rights and on civil rights. They are the basis of our individualism <clears throat> and elements of our autonomy. <clears throat> Europeans are focused on social rights and they uphold human rights. You have to abolish death penalty to become a member of the EU. British historian Timothy Garton Ash also expressed optimism about the EU's history and future in a 2013 interview, despite the Euro crisis and the bank cloud. A Europe is, he writes, is or says, is a unique creation after all. Nowhere has there been anything like it. Europe, <clears throat> by this he meant the common orientation of European nations towards peace, economic cooperation, and transnational solidarity. In my book on the European dream, I have referred to two of the drawn for the history after 45 and uh, 89. <clears throat> My argument <clears throat> is that they have lost none of their re relevance, these four principles or lessons, since they distinguish civil nation states from militant nation states. And number one is the peace project, which has been hugely challenged and is suspended now in the times of Putin's criminal war of aggression, but it certainly has not been abandoned. <laughs> Number two, the democratization project, which is very important as many member states of the EU have had one or even two like Germany dictatorial pasts. And some are again flirting with autocratic rule and fascist ideologies. More than ever, democracy matters. And in the United States, a new word has been coined, namely democracide, um, a word that has, is becoming applicable to many more states um, right now in the meantime. The third lesson, a new self-critical culture of remembrance, starting with a transnational memory of the Holocaust, which was created only four decades after 45. And number four, a new emphasis on human rights, which is becoming increasingly important and a real stress test for the moral integrity of the EU in the context of migration and integration. In order to make the distinction between the civil and the militant nation state, even more concrete, let me focus here on the third lesson self-critical memory which as i want to show is key for peace and a more sustainable future 1989 was not the end of history as uh, political scientist fukuyama believed right it was the moment when history returned it was the return of history and a new historical memory began i already mentioned uh, 1819 19, uh, 92, the opening of the Eastern Archives. A new era of history and memory began. With the end of the Cold War between capitalism and communism, the frozen memory in West and East came back with the many voices of victims of violence. Not all were heard in the same way and at the same time. The Holocaust survivors made a start of for decades of mental silence in Germany. In the 1990s, uh, an archive of 70,000 video testimonies was created, each of which offered a personal resistance against forgetting. Now I want to distinguish here between two types of memory culture, militant and civilian, civil nations differ not only in how they deal with their minorities, but also in how they deal with crimes in their own history. There are two trends in contemporary politics history that directly from each other. One trend can be called 
a politics of pride. Pride is a strong emotion. It can be healthy and constructive, but it can also become problematic if it is used exclusively for glorification. Collective health image based on the sole emphasis of national honor or in the case of defeat on the pathos, uh, pathos of martyrdom and collective suffering is bound to generate a strong enemy stereotype and to turn to violence. In such a politics of history, the prism of national memory is restricted, clearly restricted to what is acceptable. In the context of national pride, one prefers to remember victories rather than defeats, to say nothing of the crimes of one's own history. The other trend in the politics of history can be described as the politics of remorse or regret or responsibility. If the construction of memory also allows for the awareness of one's own crimes, this enables the acknowledgement of the perspective of the victim and the acceptance of responsibility in the present. An example of this contrasting approach to history is the opposition of two groups in post-communist Russia in the 1990s. They called themselves Pamyat and Memorial, both <clears throat> terms standing for memory, but interpreted in opposite ways. Memorial aimed at a self-critical memory that documented honor and very important mourned the victims of Stalin's politics. Founded by dissident and human rights ac activist Nikolai um, Sakharov, uh, Nikolai Sakharov should be, um, <clears throat> and other in Moscow, this NGO was defamed by Putin as an institution of foreign agents shortly before the attack on Ukraine and banned in Russia in December 2021. The director, Irina Shabakova, had to leave the country, and she was the one who collected the testimonies of um, the victims of Stalin's, and all of these were family memories. Um, it was um, going into the family memory and preserving their testimonies and tokens. Um, uh, this is what constituted the <clears throat> memorial ar archive and a museum. She had to leave the country. And exactly one year later now, the Zakharov Center met the same fate. Uh, it was just one or two days ago, uh, it was shut down and destroyed as one of the last strongholds of Russian civil society. Pamyat, on the other hand, is Russia's nationalist memory that focuses exclusively on pride and strength of the nation. Stalin's victory over Hitler, the Great Patriotic War, was celebrated annually on May 9th and orchestrated with large military uh, parades and uh, weapons. Since the last decades, the demonstrations included continuously the um, children and grandchildren of the Red Army soldiers, thus creating an impressive immoral regime. Putin used three generational memory uh, going through the families um, for his politics in order to transform Stalin into the greatest hero of Russian history in combination with a new Russian cult of war. In Germany, for example, the right wing party is in strong opposition to the politics of regret, pushing a similar renationalization in the name of pride and honor. <clears throat> this is why right-wing politicians denounce a self-critical attitude towards one's own history as an act of shame, a cult of guilt, or a pride of sin. Forgetting and denying, however, are no longer the most esteemed way of historical politics. On the contrary, the German model of self-criticism um, is also being discussed by other nations. Guilt and shame are and remain absolutely negative terms. But the fact that people are finally talking about what the perpetrators had hid 
and their descendants had continued to conceal is by no means generally conceived to be negative. This shift in memory politics means that it is no longer the nation that is sacred, but the dignity of the human being. <clears throat> in democratic societies, it is today a question of power and political constellations, but also a question of social education to decide which events in the shared history will eventually be remembered and forgotten in the society. And here I come to my last short chapter, and it is the European dream of Volodymyr Zelensky. There is another European protagonist who spoke of his European dream, and this was Zelensky. He expressed his commitment to the European dream in a public speech in May 2019. It was the occasion of his inauguration after his surprising success at the winning 73% uh, of the Ukrainian votes at the election. In his first formal speech, he said, we have chosen the path to Europe. There are no true and false Ukrainians. This is our common dream. And he added, what if this indeed, if this is indeed our national idea to unite, to make the impossible possible? All said in 2019. As has often been noted, as Mr. Zelensky has a great talent acting, and I would like to add, add a sharp sense also for the potential of fiction. But he could never have guessed that his idea of a common European dream would so soon have to pass the reality test of a brutal war of aggression. His European dream is becoming a reality, not only through negotiations and transformations, but now through the trauma of the Russian war of aggression. But in this traumatic everyday reality of ongoing attacks and daily destruction, such a fiction is all the more needed to keep the spirit up and the goal in mind in order to strengthen the common political will. Zelensky's European dream is certainly not an empty one. On the contrary, while waiting for the change to happen, he creates the conditions for it to come about. Supporting the collective desire and helping to make it real has become a new historical task of the EU. Since 2022, the Cold War that ended in 1990 has been followed by a hot war in the center of Europe. With Putin's invasion of Ukraine, <clears throat> we have witnessed another turning point that is changing European relations and identities. <clears throat> it is once again characterized by an East-West polarization, but now this rift divides the global world. Daily and hourly, war confronts us with new forms of destruction, aggression, and human suffering. What is at stake right now was summed up by Jeremy Rifkin almost 20 years ago when he said, universal rights, social rights, peace, quality of life, sustainability, inclusion, solidarity, cultural diversity and difference, work-life balance. This is the European dream. Of course, Europeans know that reality always falls short, but the world is watching this experiment. Yes, he is right, but the situation after 20 years couldn't be more serious. For the experiment may fail, the future is radically open. We all know what is at stake, nothing less than making the impossible possible. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Aleida Asman, for this uh, wonderful, thought provoking lecture. You have offered us so much food for thought. I'm sure there will be many comments and questions. I've got my own comments and questions, but I would like to open the field to others first. 
if there is anyone who would like to ask something or comment, please raise your hand and just come here. Marco Ferrario, you can come here. Come here, please. <laughs> Got it. Our smart PhD student, Marco Ferrario, asking a question for you. Guten, guten Tag, Professor Asman, and vielen, vielen lieben Dank für den, für den beeindruckenden Vortrag. Um, I had two, say, remarks and qu slight question. Uh, I just, I would like to hear your opinions on, on two points that you, that you raised. Uh, um, I recently happened to read a book uh, called The End of the End of History, um, in which the authors remark that actually one, one, let's say, dark side of Fukuyama's thought about the end of history, you know, of course, was not that after the fall of communism, history just stopped. Uh, but what, what ceases the, to exist was the dialectic of history, because neoliberalism has, as an ideology, not just as an economic uh, thought, uh, had won. Uh, and there was no Hegelian dialectic anymore, so no development uh, in, 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 in history, in, in this sense, in a way. And this is a rather darker side uh, than the idea you know, of this ongoing bright future that many attribute uh, to him. Uh, and in the same book, the author said that this so-called, let's say, neoliberal way, so the period of the end of history, actually ended uh, at, le at, the late, at the soonest in 2008. Uh, and now history is back uh, in somehow weird fashion because of the ongoing breakdown of the so-called neoliberal order. And uh, my, my, my question is, you, you mentioned at, at some point in, in, the, in uh, Rifkin's book that he, he mentions, for example, the, the insistence of human rights, uh, but without, for example, social justice, justice, which also hinges on the economic system and how it provides and works for the single member in society, human rights are only available for those who can afford them, like in, in the United States for many, for example. And so my question is, uh, would uh, also the preservation and the further development of the European dream, as you described it, also hinge on a thorough reconsideration on the kind of economic vision that the European Union has pursued so far? And, and the second question is um, somehow related to, 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 to Zelensky's dream. Now, I don't want to as much as I can, I don't want to touch on the on the politics, of course, of this war. And I hope nobody in this room will, you know, say doubt uh, what my position is about, uh, you know, who started all of this and where the where the responsibility lay and will lay in the future. But I like to mention an interview to a, 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 for, a prof Russian professor who had to flee the country because of his work. And he mentioned that uh, for him, as for many other Russians, uh, this invasion is first and foremost a civil war because his forefathers were Ukrainian. And now he has to witness the army of his own country laying down the tombstones of his own grandparents. And so the question is, like it's one of the miracles somehow that, that Putin <laughs> succeeded during this war was to, to drift further and further apart, not only Russia and Russian culture and the Russian people from Europe who have an entangled history ever since Peter the Great, but also Russians and Ukrainians whose, you know, Zelensky spoke, speaks Russians as, as mother tongue. And so my, my question is, um, if and how this, the European dream that you mentioned will have to take into consideration the attempt uh, of gaining back those parts of Russian societies, uh, of Russian society, I'm sorry, who have been sidelined and oppressed also by, by the current uh, Russian dictatorship in order not to just give away the entire country to the worst of their own politics, uh, or also to other foreign powers, uh, such as such as China, for, for example, which are a threat uh, to this to this dream that you described. Uh, thank you. <laughs> wow, uh, this is uh, this is fantastic. <clears throat> I could have 
listen to you endlessly. Uh, you are de developing extremely intelligent questions here. And I try to um, work my way through them, starting with the Fukuyama um, book, End of History, or the End of the End of History. Now, I think <clears throat> we, we have to know that uh, Fukuyama is an immigrant, comes from immigrant family from the Far East into the United States. And he is a proponent and exemplar of the American dream. For him, the American dream uh, is what holds the country together. This is what he has also continued to say in his identity book. He is, uh, he is supported and he keeps it up. And <clears throat> this means, however, the, European, the American dream is a, an ideology for, um, uh, for economic success at the expense of others. So it is a very, very radically radical form uh, of progress into the future that is promised to the <clears throat> immigrants coming from outside, leave behind the burden of their past, whatever it might, may be, uh, their identity. They become American globally uh, or nationally, and they can uh, enter the enterprise of uh, competition, strong, uh, hard competition and achievement and uh, gaining um, as much money as possible or <clears throat> in a few more words is it was never really whole the American society uh, but only the American society arrived from immigrants during the May flow and um, other immigrants uh, who made uh, their luck, the luck of their lives there. But uh, the black communities are not addressed. Um, first of all, they never immigrated. They're not migrants. They were deported into uh, the United States. And the year 1619 is, is, a, is a year that uh, reminds um, us of uh, the first slave ship um, uh, arriving in Virginia in, uh, in in the states, so there is another history, and they have a different um, way of life. Uh, they are, they are not uh, eager to embrace this um, rugged individualism. It is called in the United States that goes with the American, and you have to uh, really expand your elbow, elbows to um, uh, fight against each other, you know, for for success, and it's a zero sum game, and that that is, in a way, um, uh, the the liberal neoliberal economy that drives this myth of the American dream at the expense of so many um, black communities who are uh, the victims of this particular. I just talked uh, and worked together with uh, one person, um, um, a black person from Philadelphia, who, uh, who works as a lawyer and who uh, shows that the future of black cut of women um, is being gentrified and all the contracts are solved and they are left without anything and uh, have no perspectives anymore. So this, uh, the, there is an always um, ideology um, uh, to what is going on. Definitely Fukuyama is, is a proponent of neoliberalism. Now the liberal order, which is the order of the American dream, has come uh, clearly now, um, uh, well, has is in, uh, under heavy um, pressure and uh, is in crisis, and it's no longer uh, <clears throat> agreed upon among the younger generations. So I think it is, in a way, it is dying out. Um, and why is it dying out? Because of this lack, ex exactly as you say, of this element of social justice. So the young people growing up, um, and I'm referring here to Michelle Mon, um, social uh, person at Harvard University who is working on the American dream and how it is still anchored in the society, um, says that this is dwindling. You know, the, the younger generations are much more socially uh, alert now and uh, are more interested in social uh, justice and um, which is of course the, the also basis for the human rights and it needs a different uh, economic 
uh, vision and uh, certainly um, a reframing of the neoliberal order, which, as we know now, um, in terms also of global warming and, and destruction, um, is uh, uh, lethal. It is uh, self-destructive and it has to be uh, reframed uh, on two levels. On the one hand, in terms of <clears throat> the um, ecological level and on the other hand, on the economic level, it has to be framed. And I'm thinking also of uh, Karl Polanyi, the, um, uh, the, <laughs> who wrote a book about the great transformation. And uh, uh, this is all about the framing of uh, the force of capital. Um, and I think, uh, again, uh, it's the force of capital that drives the American dream. And um, it's um, the question, the, the huge question that we are, have to address. And Europe could be a new platform to, to uh, reframe uh, this. And uh, often an alternative is to reframe um, the, this logic of capital and tame it, just as I said, that the concept of the nation has to be tamed from um, militant um, uh, version to a civil version. So, and I think in this case, it would be social justice, which would procure uh, civility in this sense. And you're also right, um, now the <clears throat> Russian versus Ukrainian identity uh, question is at stake here, because as you say, uh, this is a civil war. And, but there is, there, this is a problem involved here, because in a way, uh, the, the Russian aggression was motivated by the assumption that these are our brothers and we can do with them what we want. So the civil war, yes, you are right. Uh, I can also refer to Andrei Kukov, who is the most prominent uh, writer, novelist uh, in the country. He is ethnically Russian and he writes in Russian. And still he is the most important Ukrainian uh, writer. But this is something <clears throat> uh, that is framed differently now because uh, the question is now, um, uh, where do we draw the border? I think the border was drawn through Putin who is now um, uh, really intensifying and heightening this, uh, this artificial border which used, used to be there and now we are having uh, a, a clear cut separation between the two uh, two nations. And this is the effect of the war. It's the effect of the aggression, this exaggeration of difference, because uh, the war creates friend and foe in the Karl Schmidtian sense. And now they have to take sides. And, and it's also <clears throat> not about who are we, but who do we want to become? Uh, so transformation is also going on in the process. It's not just a question of searching for genealogy and, or history. It's a, a question of how do we want to imagine ourselves. And uh, Putin reinforces um, renationalization of the culture and identity of Ukrainians, um, despite the fact that they are so closely uh, remain, uh, related. But this is a, 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 a kind of force that uh, actually enhances and accelerates this, this process. Had there been, uh, at the time of the 90s, um, people you know, like um, the, 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 the strong powers of the civil society in Russia, you know, like I, I mentioned Zakharov and others, um, who had adopted um, a more civil form of um, self-determination or self-understanding, collective self, um, self image uh, and not um, emphasize the polit Putin's politics um, in terms of a cult of war and a glorification of Stalin, it would have been possible to live very peacefully together uh, in Europe because these are Euro European standards that could have been shared uh, equally by Russia. But after the war, this is now much, much more difficult. Thank you, Professor Asman. I'm going to read you a question from a student of the University of Trento, Patrick Moser. 
Uh, on the chat, he writes, uh, uh, thank you for this very interesting and stimulating lecture. What triggered me since the beginning of the presentation is an apparent, at least for me, incompatibility and simultaneity. As you have observed, we are currently experience, experiencing a resurgence of nationalist politics, but on the same time, at the same time, it is accompanied by significant conflicts within nations. Couldn't this potentially indicate the shortcomings of nationalism and suggest that we are approaching a time of potential paradigm shifts towards new systems, maybe a sixth post-national Europe? Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, there might be a future for this wonderful idea. But uh, right now, I don't see any reality uh, for it. And I think those people who uh, really advocate it should be more clear in describing the transformation that is necessary from now to there. You know, where, how do we get there? I have talked to many, many people. Uh, the only thing that I heard was uh, we have to do away with the nation, nations. They are terribly, they are toxic. And uh, if we get uh, liberated from it, we will automatically live in this wonderful cosmopolitan, you know, uh, Republic of Europe and so forth as 687 million people without any nations, without national standard languages, without national histories, without national cultures, without anything, museums, whatever. So all this will be gone somehow evaporated in the air. So I, I have really um, thought about this long and deeply. Um, and it is, uh, your question is uh, for me very important. It's at, it's the, at the heart of my thinking. Um, what the, the step that I would make is not abolish the nation. Uh, I wrote um, in on this topic and I call it um, a reinvention of the nation, why we fear it and why we need it. This is my title. And I, of course, refer to the German nation. And in Germany, I must say, um, almost all intellectuals, all of them at the university, wherever I talk and speak, have this idea. We are not a nation state. Yeah, Germany is not a nation state. We are all cosmopolitans. You know, we live anywhere and everywhere and have no problems with anything because we are not. So among the 27 nation states that uh, uh, make up the EU. We have one nation state that is not a nation, and that it is Germany. So just to make clear where we are starting from. From my point of view, this is a rather naive uh, image. It is an image of modernization theory. And if you look at uh, the sociologists um, of modernization theory in Germany, for instance, Niklas Luhmann or Ulrich Beck, they speak all the time of the world society. So they stepped in the 80s in the 80s and 90s and 2000s they stepped directly into world society we are now all in border. and all borders are now crossed because uh, we have communication um, technologies that uh, uh, combine the world we live in connected histories we have a global world we have global citizens and so forth this is weltgesellschaft now they have not um, they're no longer around to comment on this reality in which we live now and i think we have to uh, um, uh, assess this um, image of the cosmopolitan um, non uh, uh, yeah uh, um, way of getting rid of the nation for me um, i uh, it is a different starting point that i choose i look at the danger of the nation and at the potential of the nation. And I think, and this is directly related to my topic, I think the European uh, dream is back to this issue. Uh, and this is why I started after World War I and not after World War II. Um, and the whole part of, uh, of uh, Zweig is so important for me. He already had the sense what we have to transform is the nation the concept of the nation itself. And we start by doing this in, in that we uh, make a distinction. And this distinction is never made in public discourse. Wherever na the nation is mentioned, the nation is toxic and terrible. But we, uh, I think we have to salvage the possibility of a tamed nation which has um, 
many, many advantages and is right now an advantage in the EU. Of course, um, um, I think the, the, the slogan in the 90s was uh, unity and plurality. So the plurality can only exist if you have a multiplicity of entities. And now the great um, challenge is the um, migration question and also the integration and how can a um, nation become be transformed into a diverse entity, a diverse society, diverse democratic society within a nation state. And I think this is um, the question um, around which my, my thinking revolves. And I think there are so many steps and possibilities and the EU could be a a guarantor, a, a platform for uh, developing uh, this very important issue to tame the nation. And this is why I take up uh, again uh, Stefan Zweig, the nation in Europe and the nation against Europe. The nation against Europe is reaffirming sovereignty. Um, we get back, you know, um, power. We take back control, Tony Blair and so forth. Take back control. This egomanic a machistic uh, view of the nation it could also be maternalistic. I don't want to uh, create a gender divide here, but there, there are very autocratic forms um, of the nation right now in the, in the heads and it's right in the middle of, of uh, uh, the EU. And so we have to um, fight this, um, but we can only fight this if we do not, if we say the nation matters. And I think the nation still matters if framed in the way in which I have you know, presented my paper and now try to make my um, explanation more understandable, hopefully. Thank you, Professor Asman. Following partly this line of thought, uh, I would like to um, ask you to uh, expand a bit further on what I would define as the necessary enemy, the historical figure of the necessary enemy that I have uh, somehow um, seen uh, in your presentations. And also uh, when reading your book, uh, one of the um, passages which struck me most, uh, uh, I'm going to read it, translate it into uh, English is this one. You say that after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the composition of the uh, European Union changed in the sense that it came to include uh, uh, those who were earlier enemies. And with this uh, surprising turn, uh, the Wende, uh, also the peace mission of the Union changed itself. And you wonder against whom was now turned the uh, widened uh, European Confederation. More in general, could the, uh, confeder the European Confederation resist without any more a common enemy? And this kind of thought uh, uh, makes me think about uh, important literature, uh, which is also very important in the field of ancient Greek history, about uh, the different ways of uh, structuring collective identities. Uh, the, the, there are oppositional mechanisms and there are aggregative, uh, self-centered mechanisms. So uh, my question is, uh, uh, does the European Union really need a common enemy to exist? Uh, or to put it differently, is the acknowledgement of a common enemy uh, the conditio sine qua non for the existence itself of the European Union, according to your opinion? Thank you again. A fantastic question. Thank you so much. I really enjoy your thinking and um, <clears throat> your challenges, I, um, this question is so important. And now, first of all, I think, no, it does not need it. And um, in a way, when I spoke about the European dream, I evaded another formula and that is European identity. And if you, if you speak of identity, you very easily um, get uh, trapped in the we versus they uh, issue. You know, you, you have to imagine um, an other in order to know who you are. Then we are back to back with Carl Schmidt. You know, you tell me who your enemy is and then uh, uh, you know who you are. And uh, this, um, uh, uh, I, would, I would go ahead and, and use this, the sentence of um, 
a fantastic person in, uh, in Istanbul, Khan Dink. He was murdered. He was a journalist, publisher, and murdered before his house in, in Istanbul. And one of his, he was an Armenian um, born Turk. And what he says, if your identity um, is uh, totally relying on an enemy uh, stereotype, then your identity is a sickness and you have to get rid of it. So I think this is one of the most important sentences uh, ever that I came across. So hunting for me is a, a great hero. So if we start the identity uh, game, we are very clear, uh, fast in, this, uh, in these waters, muddy waters. And when I gave you my uh, recollection of the various forms of Europe, I didn't want to make the point that without the enemies, uh, I want to show you this is how I work. I don't start with a, a the theoretical idea, but with empirical evidence. In this case, it is really the ev empirical evidence of my own life, and which I use in order to make sense of the future or the reality that is uh, changing right now in, in these um, amazing forms of transformation. So uh, I can uh, testify to the fact that um, Europe has had the European dream uh, in the various layers has had its uh, reconfiguration of an enemy. And right now, of course, the last uh, version, uh, first version was um, Russia uh, in a way for the West and with the West for Russia. And we are very close to the capitalism no longer anything that separates into his own country, but, but degeneration, moral degeneration, LGBTQ, and um, all of these things um, that have to do with, uh, with this. So he has uh, uh, or, or uh, imagined a, a conglomeration of things that people that are very conservative hate, you know. This is a very easy uh, form of um, uh, doing away um, uh, with with um, with Europe, and it is uh, reconstructing an enemy stereotype. But the question is, of course, uh, do we want to accept um, Putin's thinking? Uh, do we um, want to respond to that uh, along his terms? No, we don't want to let him prescribe the rules for our values. We have to. He's prescribing the rules for war, but. Uh, he described the rule. Professor Asman, I'm sorry for interrupting you. We cannot hear you very well. I okay. Maybe can maybe um, uh, I would suggest that you uh, stop your video so maybe the internet connection okay. will be more stable. I'm sorry for asking that. Okay. It's better when the image is on. Can you hear me? Not very well properly. You cannot. Okay. I connect. Uh, shall I try or? Come closer to the mic. Is it is it okay like this? Huh. Hmm. Hello? Are you there? We, we can hear you, yes. Uh, Hopefully I... without seeing you, maybe. We are sorry for not seeing you, but of course, maybe we can oh. hear you better. Okay. Um I will say a few sentences and then you will tell me whether you got anything across. Okay. Now we can hear. Thank you. Oh. Sorry for interrupting oh. you. No, thank you. Please always interrupt because that's the meaning that we get something across here. Thank you. Now, I wanted to say the question is, um, is there a possibility for a future of the EU without an enemy 
stereotype uh, that binds the group together. And I say definitely, and this is why I chose the language of the European dream or the European project or lessons from history, which are projected into the future. So if we are thinking about uh, a set of values that a group um, actually buys into and abides by, uh, I call it even in the Swiss terminology an Eidgenossenschaft, a group that takes a common oath. You know, it's a common oath. I think that um, membership in the EU uh, actually means. So this common oath thing doesn't need an uh, enemy. Uh, it needs just a commitment to shared goals. And uh, I think this is very important. The goals to be projected into the future and not denounced as something of the past and no longer value, valid. Thank you, Professor Asman. Your answer somehow is uh, reassuring for, for the future. Are there any other questions in the room or online? If there is anyone online who would like to ask a question, just appear on the screen, please. If not, I will spend hours asking questions to Professor Asman. I, Marco, do you have another one? Yes, come here. Entschuldigung, bin ich, bin ich wieder, aber war, also wie Georgia meinte, auch schon so viel angeregt von, von, von diesem Gespräch. So, my, um, I had two quick follow-ups, uh, and one is related to, let's say, the migrant uh, question, and the other comes back to Russia also for, let's say, a reason of personal interest and love. Uh, on the migrant question, I, I always like to, to, to mention um, a, a very important enterprise, cultural enterprise here in Italy called the Biographical Dictionary of, of the Italians, which in, in one of the volumes, uh, um, there is an entry, I think it's not the only one, but I remember one, on, uh, on an Arab uh, scholar, geographer, if I'm not mistaken, active at the, the, the court of Frederick, Frederick II in Sicily. And uh, I loved the fact that the editors included this guy uh, in, in a biographical dictionary, you know, of Italians, uh, because as you know, I mean, one of, on, on, on one of the several wonders of Putin's war in a way is that now we forgot uh, that our enemy, the enemy of our, of our civilization was Islam, you know, and whatever Muslims, uh, uh, Muslims were, whatever that meant. Uh, and so I'm, my question is, do you think that also, let's say, while looking east for, for the reason you mentioned also in your talk, it would be important for the European dream also keep looking south uh, because, I mean, in a way, let's say that North Africa and uh, what we, part of the Middle East uh, at least, uh, is also part, uh, was part of, of European history and uh, many of our societies uh, are full of people who come from Turkey, Morocco, Egypt, but they are, many of them are fully integrated in European society. They understand themselves as European. And, and so the question is, if it, if it would ever be possible to, at least on our side, and what happens on the other side, it's more difficult to, to, to figure, but if it would be possible on our side, uh, at least to take into account uh, let's say, a, a broader Mediterranean identity as one pillar of the, of the European dream in order to avoid, you know, that kind of clash of civilization idea, which is somehow all too popular. And, and the, the second question was a, a follow-up on your answer on, on, on say, this Russian-Ukrainian uh, issue. My question, my initial question actually was, if you think if it is possible, you know, because you said we have to take stands, that the, the, the war forced the, us uh, also in Europe to take stands. Uh, and I, I mean, I agree with that. Uh, the question is, uh, would we ever be able to take stand for Ukraine uh, as long as it takes uh, while not giving up on the Russians uh, and in a way on, on Russia itself? Uh, because... I think that if that doesn't happen, how it would happen, I, I, I'm not sure. But if it doesn't happen, I think that we might find ourselves into a very dangerous dead end uh, on the kind of this uh, eth ethnic identity politics uh, that you mentioned, uh, 
And given that you said also, you know, that we don't we don't have to let Putin choose the terms of the war, at least in Italy, I'm sorry to say, but in a way, in a way, he already succeeded. Uh, maybe you heard of the fact that uh, some months ago, a professor was invited to take a to give a course on Dostoevsky, then the war started, and the university asked him uh, to give up uh, on that course because Dostoevsky was, you know, was too Russian uh, to be taught. And I think this is, we, we have, if, if that is the path, uh, then we already lost. And so back to, to, to the question, can we, can we stand with Ukraine while not giving up on the Russians? Thank you. Well, um, again, thank you very much. This, these are so important questions. Um, first of all, let me emphasize um, that um, the integration um, of so many um, different backgrounds and cultures into Europe has become um, luckily by now um, an, an everyday thing. It is uh, speaking of diversity under our arch enemy. I just two days ago I was in Vienna and looked at the Heeresgeschichtliche Museum, the Museum of, of Wars and uh, Uniforms and, and Weaponry. And uh, there, if you if you go there, uh, you have the presence of the Habsburg era, um, and the young children that are led into this museum are still learning how the uh, Christians defended um, uh, Vienna from the Turks. You know, evidence in which this is still made there with an enormous, powerful images. So this thing that we have to uh, look at more carefully uh, how we actually um, and how we fired into our the vision. So um, the the when I talked the first word concerned one and this is uh, important here as well and the, the point is Hound wars. This is the question that I learned from the Jewish historian George Mossy. And he wrote a book about the Great War, the First World War, and showed that it would never end it. So this was my key for my thinking. And I'm very alert to seeing which wars and issues were never ended. And I think ending them symbolically, also monuments or museums, and there is so much um, that uh, still uh, continues um, in terms of symbolic array uh, in the present day, be it the cityscape or the museums, that suggest that there's a continuity into today. One has also to distance oneself, say, this is over. And while uh, I think you are right, uh, this um, is over. I don't need, we need a strong Mediterranean uh, group to enlarge uh, the EU, um, because I think that would create a very uh, uh, problematic new divide that between uh, uh, Zup, uh, Sahara, and the, or, uh, the, the Mediterranean countries. And what we have now uh, really as something coming uh, in, in of becoming aware of and taking in into our self-image and consciousness is um, uh, the uh, colonial history of Europe. I refer to the House of European History and this nice idea we are doing, uh, you know, crossovers and connections rather than individual nations. But uh, they, I think, are responsible for also showing a long-term history and which is uh, Europe's colonial past. And this uh, colonial past of Europe uh, is going much beyond the Mediterranean uh, identity, which was a, an issue for Sarkozy and others. But, but now we are, I think, in a, in a totally different um, horizon. And uh, what we have to acknowledge is that this is part very written into the EU and uh, the countries of the EU, and that they are, we are here in a, in a process of really deep transformation in terms of the self-image and the question in which way do we uh, acknowledge these histories and make it possible for people from these 
uh, ends of the world uh, to become citizens of the EU because they are entangled in this history and and share it in in a way. So my my vision is really going beyond the Mediterranean and uh, also thinking about the uh, legacy of colonial history. And in terms of Russia, of course, this this continuing uh, war hysteria about um, the uh, the cultural heroes of of Russia. Uh, this is something that absolutely has to be overcome, and uh, it can be overcome if, if um, many Russian people support this view and show us another Russia that is not uh, Putin's Russia. The question right now, uh, the problem right now is that the, um, Putin has managed to create a silence in the country. We see very little, we see brave protests, and we are really... Uh, deeply impressed with this, but we also see a lot of silence and conformism. And uh, a number one rule seems to be uh, security. Yeah, the security is, is more important than uh, liberty. But here again, I would like to uh, call back um, Nikolai um, uh, Sakharov, uh, whose three uh, values were uh, number one, peace, number two, free liberty, and number three, human rights. So if there are more, more Zakharovs, you know, standing up today, uh, they would, I, I think we would have a common um, ground uh, in terms of values. And then we do not have to bother uh, uh, anymore about identity politics. Thank you. Does anybody has got questions? Thank you, Professor Asman. Does anybody has have questions? Otherwise, if you don't mind, Professor Asman, I will ask you my last question. Um, it is about the relationship between uh, remembering and forgetting. Um, in several important studies, and uh, also today to some extent, uh, you showed us uh, how uh, remembering and forgetting are two faces of the same coin and that they are often interdependent and they are almost never mutually exclusive. Um, we uh, ancient historians are pretty familiar with the concept of uh, public forgetting as a sort of uh, cultural therapy uh, in, uh, for example, post-war periods, uh, public forgetting as a way of coming to terms and overcoming uh, difficult periods or uh, traumatic pasts. Um, the most famous examples is uh, uh, that concerning classical Athens when the uh, decision of Mnesika Kane of don't re do not remember uh, the evil, the bad, was legally introduced in Athens after the end of the civil war, after the end of the Peloponnesian War in 404 BC. Um, so my, my question is, um, I also read some important pages by Christian Meyer uh, on this subject. My question is, at this stage, in your opinion, does Europe as an imagined community uh, and also as a political entity uh, needs more remembering or needs more forgetting? I don't know that there cannot be a sharp uh, recipe, of course, but which is your idea on the compenetration and the interaction between uh, uh, remembering and forgetting today in the European Union? Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Georgia, for this uh, wonderful question and also for bringing in anti antiquity and, and your own research into our debate, which I find really fascinating. And of course, I read the book by Christian Meyer about Athens and Mnesika Kane, uh, the, um, the, um, the uh, it, where it is forbidden to, to um, speak about uh, the past. Of course, nobody can rule forgetting. Um, that's a different thing, but you can at least um, uh, uh, prevent people from raising issues in public that are dormant and that can raise uh, hatred and become problematic. So this obviously worked in the past and you, we can add another date in history and that is 1648, the peace of uh, Münster and Osnabrück when actually after the waging um, religious war of the 30 years war, uh, the two parties decided to end in um, perpetua um, oblivio et amnestia. 
and uh, I gave you the quote <clears throat> from Churchill. And you recall that he says the, the House of uh, Europe can only be established if it is grounded on a complete oblivion of all the crimes and follies of the past. So this was exactly along the lines of Christian Meyer and um, the Athens uh, plan. And, um, uh, and this is why everybody accepted it, because it had its truth. When, when uh, Churchill um, uh, said this, um, everybody thought, what was the, in the background of the mind of the people? It was the First World War. It had never ended, obviously, because um, the, the mo mobilizing went on immediately. The detoxification did not come about that um, uh, Zweig was so uh, desperate about. So um, it did not work. So um, then after the Second World War, it, they thought we have to forget and everything will be fine. So it was very fine, especially for Germany. Uh, the perpetrators were very relieved this idea. And for four, again, I said four decades, it worked in Germany. There was a leaden silence you know, that covered everything. Uh, there were many people who wanted to speak, but it was agreed publicly uh, that forgetting is, is the right way into a future to wipe the slate clean for a few new future. This is also the basic idea of the American dream. This is why the future is also erased in the American dream. Now, for me, um, in the 90s, uh, uh, already in the 80s, uh, it was amazing that the past could come back. I had learned that it is gone forever. You know, this is what all my teachers told me and taught me. Uh, it's it's gone forever. You cannot retrieve anything, and uh, memory is of no use. And until today, I'm confronted with many historians who every day try to teach me that I should forget about memory. Yeah, you know? because it is for them a stumbling block. They do not know what to do with it. It does not fit into this time regime of modernity idea where you always expect a new future and leave behind um, a past that you dismiss and that you think is uh, is gone forever. But it it returns. The term trauma has shown um, that, uh, that was inscribed of the psychiatric uh, handbook in America in 1980. So very late, um, after the Second World War, there was no trauma theory. After uh, only with the Vietnam War, the term came back and then it came back for all those traumas that were in store. So we have no way of just um, <clears throat> wiping this clean. I think um, this has not worked. It, it has worked. I should add, it has worked in symmetric warfare so, uh, situations. So if there was violence on both sides, it worked. And it was the Spanish example after the Spanish Civil War when it was tried again. And um, it was uh, the new democracy was based um, in the 70s on a pact of silence. But even there, it didn't work. Uh, the, the rupture of the past is happening every day. People are uh, exhumed, um, corpses are exhumed. People are looking the, the, for their family members and so forth. And even Franco himself was exhumed from this uh, monument of the fallen and put into a private um, uh, tomb. So, so now we can really say it, it has lost its power. You know, it has lost its power together with this time regime of modernity that is promising us clean breaks from the past and an ever bright future that doesn't work anymore. Thank you, Professor Asman. I think we can say a, a huge thank you for this wonderful lecture and also for your uh, generous answers afterwards. Uh, thank you so much. If you want to appear on the screen, we are happy to say goodbye, at least virtually. Thank you so much. I hope that we will be chances to be in touch also in the future. Thank you very, very much. And thank you all for your fantastic questions and also really for founding this fantastic interdependent departmental lab that includes literature and sociology and history. So I, I think you have um, created something for the future and I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you once again. Goodbye. Bye-bye.